right, so good morning, everybody. My name is Jesse, and welcome to another exciting Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants broadcast with us here. We do 50 broadcasts every single month featuring the coolest scientists, explorers, and conservationists working to protect light on this planet, and everything we do goes to our YouTube channels. If you want to see 3,000 past programs, check out this one in like five years. You can absolutely go there and take a look. Today, I'm particularly excited because we are midway through day three of our epic Oceans Week Spectacular. We have 21 broadcasts happening this week with just the most incredible people from across planet Earth. And we are partnering with the amazing folks at the Explorers Club to make this possible. They feature and celebrate and showcase the coolest explorers on planet Earth. And we've had the chance to partner with them live from the Explorers Club with some of their amazing featured explorers and more all for Oceans Week. You can check out their full list of Oceans Week programs below. I'm particularly excited to today on a personal note because we are welcoming back Jamal Galvez and he is a superhero of the conservation world. He's had an incredible year. He was named one of the Explorers Club's top 50. He's a proud new papa personally like as a dad which is so spectacular and he is the leading voice for protecting manatees on this planet. Today he's going to share with us a little bit about his incredible work to save these charismatic creatures and so without further do i don't want to take any more of his thunder i want to let you hear from him welcoming in jamal thank you so much for being with us here today man <laughs> thank you for having me it's always a pleasure around to get the opportunity to share to tell uh, stories of these pieces across the globe they are pretty cool i can see why you chose them and i know you've got a lot to share with us if you want to dive in and bring up the presentation again we are good to go man i'm so excited <laughs> um it's already sharing i'm not sure if it's not on your end no it, it unshared you took it down you gotta bring it back up again i'll let you know when it's in <laughs> okay there we go just thinking about it this is half the fun something should go a little strangely in every video broadcast otherwise you're not having a good time okay so here we go <laughs> While you're doing that, I will note that you have a spectacular Instagram page that our audience can check out after this program, too. So if you want to see Jamal looking just totally awesome with all sorts of manatees and smiling ear to ear his entire life, you can check out that page. It is very fun. <laughs> Thank you, man. There we are. Perfect. Now it's working. Sometimes it just takes a little cajoling. There you go. You're good yeah. to go, man. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to wherever you are. I know that there are people here on different time zones. So um, whatever time of the day it is, I bid you the best. Um, my name is Jamal Galvez, also known as the Manantiman. Um, I'm with the Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute um, in Belize, and I'm the program coordinator and the research biologist. And today I'll be talking about our conservation efforts to safeguard the endangered and telemanantis of Belize. Many of you may have seen this dolphin before um, from the movie Dolphin Tail. Her name is Winter. Um, the Clearwater Marine Aquarium, whom I work for, actually has been the home for this dolphin for many years. So we're not just a typical aquarium. We're a rescue center that provides care for marine species in need. But we also carry out research across the globe. We work in some of the world's most fragile coastal ecosystems and so with, along with some of the world's most endangered species. Our focus is on flagship species, but today I'll be talking to you specifically about the Manantis and our efforts there in Belize. So what do we do? We rescue injured orphan um, marine mammals, dolphin, manantis, whales, even turtles. Um, we rehabilitate them and then we release them back into the wild where they belong. Our work also include research and conservation and inspiration. I'll start off by showing you a short video of which highlights the efforts in Belize. Um, we were once called Sea to Shore Alliance and we we transferred over to, 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 to become Clearwater Marine Aquarium Research Institute. So I'll share this video, it's an older video, so it's branded Sea to Shore Alliance, but it's about our work in Belize.
Belize has the highest population of the Antillean manatee in the world, and we'd like to keep it that way. The Sea to Shore Alliance and our partners have been fighting to protect our environment and these endangered manatees. Each year, however, their death rate continues to increase rapidly due to watercraft collision, destruction of coastal habitat, entanglement in fishing gears, garbage pollution, and poaching. Yes, poaching. These animals are in dire trouble and they need our help. It's our responsibility as Belizeans to protect what belongs to us. In order to create a safe environment and future for our aquatic friends, we must act now. Respecting no wake zones and manatee habitat is important. Practice sustainable fishing methods and properly discard damaged fishing gear. People throw garbage everywhere, except in the garbage can. Garbage stops here. When we safeguard important habitats such as mangroves, seagrass beds, the barrier reef, and our marine lives, we are safeguarding our livelihoods. I want you to look after my future. What about me? When I grow up, I want this manatee. We are asking for your support, and we thank you for recognizing the importance of manatees and their habitats. Thank you for caring. Big thank you from our aquatic friends. I am a humanity Arian. I am a humanity Arian. We are humanity Arians. Protect. Protect. We, we protect. protect. We should protect our manatees. We must protect them. Protect what belongs to us. Protect ours. So that video should have highlights the, the plight that these animals are facing in Belize and what we're doing to try and protect them. Um, but like everything when and these have their family, their family are from the order of Sirenia. Sirenia is also a term used for mermaid. And in, the, in that family, there are five different species. We have the Amazonian manante in the top left of the screen, which is found in, found in the Amazon River of Brazil. That species is confined to fresh water. Below, we had the West African manant, which is found in West Africa. The largest of the family is the stellar sea cow, which had gone extinct decades ago due to overhunting pressures. But bring things into perspective, imagine the largest, strongest of the species have gone extinct decades ago when the world had way less people. Uh, plastic pollution was not even a conversation. Climate change wasn't even thought about. The population was just not in the magnitude in which it would have affected the species. But yet that species could have gone extinct. Bring fast forward to today and bring things into perspective now, where the world is overpopulated, plastic pollution is everywhere, the ocean is, is, is impacted by human activities, climate change is right upon us. It makes you realize that there is a likely a possibility that we could see an extinction of another one of these family species. And so our goal is to ensure that that does not happen. Above that is the dugong, which is found off the coast of Australia and this the Africa. And then there's the West Indian manante. This one is a little bit interesting as the West Indian manante has two different subspecies. The Floridian manante, which is found in Florida, and the Antillian manante, which is found, which is found in the Caribbean and Belize. Don't look alike, but the closest to them and these are artifacts, hyrax, and elephants. Elephants seem a little bit more similar, but those are the three most closest relative to manantis. Why are they important for conservation? First of all, in Belize, they're the only extant aquatic herbivorous mammals within our waterways. Um, the population estimates to be just around 1,000, and Belize has the largest population of the species in the world. It means that other countries that do have this species have smaller numbers. So the efforts in Belize is critical, not just for the survival of the species in Belize, but for the survival of the species throughout its range. Just a little bit of facts. Um, and this can live about 30 years in the wild. I say in the wild because they're proven to live longer um, in captivity. Um, in places like, um, like, for instance, there's a manante named Snuri that passed away. I think she was 70 something years old. But it shows that they can live as long as humans. But in the wild, the pressures, the pressures that are brought upon them literally cut their lifespan in half. 
They're generally slow moving animals, but they can swim about 15 miles per hour at short bursts. They get gas, they get tired, need to rest. And these animals are extremely large. They can get about 1,200 pounds and 10 to 12 feet in length, literally the size of a small pickup truck in length and weight. The top photograph here, you can see an extra vision of the Manante, um, which shows you this pink area is actually the Manante lung, which runs along the entire spinal column. It's very important for them in terms of buoyancy. The lung allows them to stay under for about 10 to 15 minutes and it allows them to be buoyant in the water. It's unfortunate where the lung is situated that it's, it's on their back, resting on their ribs, and that's often the place where they get hit by boats. Those rib, those rib bones often break from blunt object, blunt hit from boats, and those bones, broken bones, end up piercing organs such as lung, which is detrimental and eventually um, critical and probably likely lead to death after one and thing. These animals have generally good hearing skills, but they're unable to tell the direction the song is coming from, hence the reason they often get hit by boats. They have very sensitive spurious hearers on their body that helps them to determine currents, um, vibration, um, objects coming towards them. And they are considered social aquatic loners, meaning they don't have any BFF, no girlfriends, no OGs, no road dogs, no bodies. Whatever term people are using these days, the only bonding is between a mother and its calf, and it's the most important bond, as a calf would not survive without its mother's care. They communicate using short harmonic squeaks and squeals, kind of <coughs> very low frequency, and it's generally between a mother and its calf. Hence the reason mother and calf tend to stay really close together. So when a mother and a calf become separated, it's very difficult for them to get back together. Unlike whales that can communicate from, from mouths, um, these animals don't do that. They are herbivores. They feed generally on submerged and emergent vegetation. They often, you'll see them sticking their heads up, grabbing off some mangrove overhanging over the water. These animals eat a lot. They eat about 9 to 10% of their body weight daily, um, which makes them very important to the ecosystems as they are considered one of the best nutrient recyclers. Um, man, and this, uh, eat a lot, so they, they, they poop a lot. They poop acts as food for small fishes and crustaceans, and big fish eat small fishes, and humans tend to eat fishes as well. So in other words, we've had all had a little bit of an anti-poop in a lifetime, but I don't hear anybody complaining. These animals need access to fresh water. They don't need it every day, but they also need fresh water. It's quite difficult to tell a, a male from a female. It's quite difficult to tell a male from a female in Manantis. Because you can't really tell a male from a female by looking in their face. The only way you can tell is if you're able to see the stomach area and a male genital opening tends to be closer to the uh, umbilicus, which is in the midsection of the manante, while the female genital opening tends to be closer to the tail. So you can't look at the manante and say, oh, he's cute or she's cute. Might be offended because it might be a male and you're thinking that it's a female or a female and you're thinking that it's a male. The only thing that you'll find that manantis are aggressive um, is during mating. Um, you'll have 10 to 15 males chasing out the one female. This can go on for about two, two to three weeks. And the females tend to find refuge in shallow areas since the male need to access their stomach area to, to mate with them. They tend to want, in, want to go into shallow waters where they can line their stomach to the rest and to avoid being drowned. Um, manantis, are, though they're gentle, when they're mating, they're not necessarily always gentle. So imagine you have 10 to 15 meals trying to climb on top of you in 20 feet of water. This oftentimes results in, in drowning of the female. Um, the female doesn't get to choose the strong, buff, handsome guy. Um, they just tend to mate with the most dominant males and uh, they'll mate with more than one males, hence the reason it's very difficult to tell who the father is. And the males play no role in parenting. These are photographs of mating activities. You can see it kinda, it's a lot of trash in around and it can get very rowdy. The reproduction doesn't help their population and mainly because of the pressures they brought on human beings. Um, they're basically fighting an uphill battle. Male being referred to as bull um, becomes sexually mature at nine to 10 years of age, while the female becomes mature more earlier 
at three years. Though you've seen some males produce viable sperm at earlier at six years old, they generally become mature at 10 to 9 to 10 years old. Their first pregnancy does not happen until about four or five years old, and they're pregnant for 12 months. So unlike humans who tend to have a gestation period of nine months, um, the, the manantis, they tend to do a full year. They can have a single calf every three to five years. They do, they can. There's a possibility of having twins, but it's very, very rare. And they still do this matter for about two years. So it takes about 12 years, roughly, for the process to occur, for uh, to replace every manantis that we've, had, that we've seen um, being killed. I don't think much joy in sharing this picture, but this is a young, this is a young uh, female taken away by a, a backhoe. Her eyes still pierced open after being hit by a boat. Um, but this is the reality of these animals, and the story needs to be told. Um, like I said, I don't take any pleasure in showing fish photos such as this, but people need to understand what the plight these animals are facing and what human beings are causing to them. I often say that humankind is an oxymoron because humans aren't always kind. Um, but we need to be for these animals um, to speak up and to, to bring, bring a voice and to bring some sort of relief for these species that cannot um, help or speak for themselves. Um, this graph shows you the among common that have died since 1995. And you've seen a general increase in trends since 2012. Except in the year of 2016, where we had a project that was specifically targeted at, at monitoring and effect and, and patrolling and enforcing speeding regulation in a specific area. However, 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 the increase continued until we got into COVID-19, where we saw another decrease in the number of manatees that were killed. And in 2022, in 2022, sorry, the increase went back to its normal levels. Typically, manantis like to live in um, coastal ecosystems where they have access to fresh water and shelter from highway of action. But unfortunately, that's the same place that people like. We like to live up to the water, the beaches, the coast. Um, manantis are generally um, endangered because they used to be hunted in the past. Um, they used to be... Why? They used to be hunted in the past, and um, hunting have caused them to, to, to become endangered. And and that has been replaced by watercraft collision. Um, many manatees have died due to watercraft collision, and no other other pressures now that they face include habitat destruction, entanglement in fishing gears, garbage pollution, and climate change. I'm going to show a video here that should have highlights that shows you how manatees see boats. We see boats as a fun pleasure craft to be on, um, but manatees see them in a different light. So this is how man and these actually see boats from the this is to bring you in their purview in their in their views in their vision. Where'd you get this one? Oh, I got that one last winter on my way here. What about that one on your shoulder? Is that a new one? Crying out loud. But you ask about that one every year. Well it looks new. Oh, I got that one back in 99. Yeah, that was a rough year. I don't know how many we lost that year. Speaking of which, have you guys seen a lane yet this year? So that's General Homan and these sea boats. It's not a fun object to them. It's not a pleasure craft to them. What we see it as a fun, pleasurable craft, craft they see it as a life-threatening machine. Oftentimes, these animals get hit by boats, and sometimes they leave a young calf. These calves are left to fend for themselves, and a calf will not survive without its mother. This young male was rescued off the coast of Belize City in garbage was lying around in a lot of plastic pollution. Um, he was two to three years old. Like I mentioned, without, without his mother, the cure would have likely died. So we had to intervene. We rescued this young male, very dehydrated, very hungry, very skinny, emaciated, haven't eaten in a while. And one of the first things we'd like to do is to introduce some PLI to the animal to help with feeding, to help to rehydrate the animal. 
um, and it's transported to the rescue center for care. We, keep it, we, we tend to want to keep it wet so it's comfortable during transport. They can stay out of water for a long period of time. This may seem as a, as a quite a success story to have been rescued, but it's yet it's still not a full success story. As what we've taken away from this piece is taking a calf away from its mother, taking a mother away from its calf, um, leaving the mother being killed, leaving a calf being orphaned. An orphan is not a fun place for anybody, even not even in human human lifestyle. Um, what we've taken away from this from this from these wildlife. No amount of donation, no amount of time, no amount of dedication, no amount of effort you can put in can replace what we've taken away from them. What we're doing is, what we're doing, what we're giving is simply a, a small gesture, but it doesn't amount to what we've taken away from them. So for, since, since, why? Since since 1996, we've been studying manantis in Belize. We've been researching these animals to get a better understanding of their health, um, their movement patterns, to, so that we can better protect them. So we actually catch wild manantis. To date, we've caught 197 manantis. We looked at their health, we, their measurements, weight, and we put transmitters on them to, to, to follow their, their movement so that we can see where they go to be able to protect these specific space that they like the most, to put regulations in space to, to, to protect them from boating activities. Um, and we monitor their behaviors to, to, like I said, to try and put conservation actions in place, whether it's no wake zones. If we see animals spending time in a specific place for a long period of time, we tend to want to alert boaters that animals are in these specific spaces so that they don't intrude on these spaces. We do joint patrols with the Coast Guard and, and, the, and the Port Authority move all of gill nets and illegal gill nets in places where that there should not be. And we do awareness in schools, public spaces, universities, offices, in anywhere, in this, in this space that is available for us to speak to, to try and bring the plight of these animals to light. We want the world to understand the plight these animals are facing. We do workshops with tour guides and boat captains to, to teach them how to boat in areas they and these are in an effort to try and bring some sigh of relief for these pieces mantis in we do we talk about mantis in schools in um classrooms to try and educate students so that they can understand the plight that these animals are facing and to try and inspire these this next generation to be a part of the conservation of the species because for me also for me i started at a young age um i started at 11 years old i want to share the story with you here I was an explorer at the age of 11. I saw my grandma's lawn. I see a weird looking boat go by. I heard that they're doing research about an animal that I care about. And these are very important to my life. It's not a job to me. I felt it was my duty to speak up for these animals that can speak for themselves. Just because they can't speak doesn't mean that they don't have something to say. Change has to come and someone has to do it. Why can't I be that someone? My name is Jamal Galvez and my mission is to safeguard the Antilliman and the police. So my message to you is to, to, 
to inspire to want to do inspire to want to be something because you guys are the future and you don't have to want to protect manantis but do something for conservation whether it's volunteer wake up and, and, and tell a story um, i've told you the story of these animals i expect you to tell that story to five other people so that five other people can tell that story to five other people so that the plight of these animals so that the challenges animals are facing can be heard you are the next generation you are the future it is our responsibility as conservation is to teach you the idea of conservation and preservation otherwise it better teach you survival the color world that we live in right now will not be the same if you don't do as to, to the problems that they're facing conservation requires no specific degree or educational background all it requires a heart and a desire to want to be a part of change there's no prerequisite for conservation there's no excuse as to why you can't be a part of it there should not be no excuses because you're doing something that will make the world a better place the place that you live in so you're so it's a, it's it's an act it should be an act of willingness but i encourage you to start now age is not a restriction sex religion belief there's no restriction in conservation conservation is for every single person on this planet and i implore on you to start now i'll end by sharing this last video of our recent man that we rescued of the crossing beliefs These animals need our help, they need all of our help, and you too can be a part of protecting this species. You too can be a part of spreading the word on this species. And with that, I'll say thank you. Oh. Have any questions? Thank you, Jamal. Honestly, I get to work with conservationists every single day, and you're one of the most passionate guys I ever have the chance to feature. Uh, what an absolute pleasure, and you're doing such incredible work. I just, honestly, professional detachment is out the window. Just so much fun getting to hang out with you today, man. Uh, we've got a bunch of spectacular classes live with us on YouTube with us and more. I'm going to come to Miss McNeil, Miss James class, Miss Luce class in just a second. Before I do, just a quick question we got from one of our groups via email. Um, you are taking the manatees out of the water. We have these videos of you getting them. How do you try and prevent injury to the manatee or to yourselves when you're doing that process? It's so essential to the work that you do, but it seems like it could be potentially the riskiest thing that you do. So what, what are the precautions? Correct. Uh, we do not we do not take an animal out of the wild unless we absolutely have to. Yeah. So yeah. in those videos, you 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 there's process that you don't see. Um, perhaps, like for instance, when you get there, the report of an injured man, and we tend to monitor the animal behavior to make sure that that animal actually needs to be rescued. There's no joy in taking them until the wild. Um, it costs a lot to take them out of the wild, so we prefer keeping them in the wild. Um, if we see an injury that seems to be minor, that animal just needs to recuperate, we tend to just continue to monitor and leave the animal to be. Um, in terms of calves, we tend to be there for about an hour and a half monitoring that calf to make sure that it's actually an orphan calf. Make sure it's not a, a calf left in a corner by a mother while she goes out to feed, and we, we tend to rub the calf um, in in that in that in that portion of time. So we so a lot of due diligence is done. Um, we also use drones to fly in the area to ensure that there's no other manante in that area to ensure that that calf, like I said, is is actually an orphan calf because taking a calf out it will be with us for about two to three years, which we don't want because it's expensive to have them there. So the goal is to keep them in the wild with their with their mother. As it relates to the to, to, to safety, animal safety is priority, human safety is priority. Anything that we do takes into consideration the animal and human safety. We will not we will not try and catch an animal if it presents a huge amount of danger. If the if the if the 
the location that it that is in, that is that it is in is not safe for both human and animal um there are things that we do to ensure that the animal is safe perhaps for instance when you're using nets um nets can be dangerous but if if it's used properly by experienced individual there's a process that we do to make sure that it's, it's, it's safe we've never had an animal die on us during rescue we're doing rescue um things that you know of the animal such as knowing how long it can stay on the water when it needs to come over to breathe when it's here you can tell as a, as a as a long term rescuer you can tell to be able to know what to do at what per, what portion of a time grabbing a man and in the water oftentimes i will do that after i see the animal breed so i know that it has actually taken a good breath so it can be submerged for a while and holding the animal without crushing it is another ideal thing though they are strong though that they look um bulky you can harm them by squeezing them too tight so it's just a matter of knowing their behavior, understanding their anatomy, understanding their reproductivity, understanding their behavior helps you to, 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 to ensure that whatever you're doing is at the is that is it is in the most careful manner yeah. and in the best interest of the animal. That is a very nuanced answer, and I appreciate it immensely. Thanks, man. Um, Miss Lewis Klaus, I'm gonna head to you guys. If you want to come on in grade fours, you're good to go. Hey. How how can manatees get injured except for poaching? Oh, except how for poaching. What are other ways manatees get injured, Jamal? Manatees can get injured. They get entangled in nets. Um, they get separated from a mother and a calf from from their mother. The calf needs its mother to survive. The mother feeds the the calf milk. So if it doesn't have milk, they would die. Um. They can ingest garbage. So if you throw garbage in the waterways, they can ingest garbage, and that can also kill them. Um, their habitat is being destroyed um, for, from dredgers tearing up the mangrove, tearing up the seagrass to build cruise sports and and resorts and condos. Those things are destroying their habitat. So their habitats is being destroyed. So their home has been destroyed, and if they have no home, they'll be homeless. So those are some ways that they that affect them as well. Climate change is also a problem. The changes changes in the water temperature, the water level affects seagrass. So places that manatees may have been feeding for many years, they go over there and then there's no seagrass. So they have to find food in other places. I uh, love that you mentioned the sheer diversity of them. I mean, there are a lot of threats facing manatees. A lot of the species were featuring during Ocean's Week, but that is... Uh, it underscores the importance of having people like you that are working to combat those threats in a variety of ways. And I think one of the big things that we always like to highlight is that there's so much hope for wildlife because there's this huge interest in this from everybody. Everybody 18 and under knows the facts, is super keen to take action, and are really inspired by people doing the work that you are. In fact, um, Miss James's class, our Kingston crew, has mentioned they're very moved by your presentation today, which is really nice. Um, and our uh, in that class, Kara wants to know how much seagrass they eat. So when they're going along munching, how much per day do they eat, Jamal? <laughs> so uh, manatees are herbivores, and they eat about 9 to 10% of, uh, of their seagrass. So if you do the maths, a manatee that's, that's um, let's say, 900 pounds, eat 9 to 10% wow. of that every day. So it's a lot of seagrass that they eat a lot, a lot. And I like to refer to them as the lawnmowers of the sea. So that's basically they're swimming around just eating seagrass all day. Um, so their their life their life is basically eat, sleep, eat, sleep on repeat. I've seen shirts like that, but that's basically what manantis do. Um, they eat a lot. So like I mentioned, they can get up to the size of a small pickup truck in length and weight. They can get up to 12, 12 to 1,500 pounds. They, we've seen even bigger than that um, in the wild. So they eat plenty. Plenty. By the way, I, I like your willingness to be a manatee in this program. Uh, a lot of our speakers are unwilling to mimic the animals that they take care of, and I appreciate it immensely. Um, Miss McNeil's class, Lethbridge, Alberta, I'm going to come to you guys live. If you've got a question for Jamal, come on up. Hey, two threes. Hello. Hello. All right, let me ask your question. What is the fastest speed a manatee can swim? Ooh. The fastest one on this can swim is about 15 miles per hour. So that might be slow for you, but a fast for a man on thing. And because they're mammals, they get gas, they get tired. So after swimming 15 miles per hour, which may last about 
30 seconds and then they're gassed, they're tired. Remember, they're large, so they're not fast moving animals. They tend to be very slow moving animals. So 15 miles per hour is what we know the, the largest speed for them to be. And for our Canadian friends, about 20, 22 kilometers, which is faster than Usain Bolt can run. So they are, I mean, they're slow in the animal kingdom, but humans are slower in everything. We really are the slowest creature out there. It's pretty sad. Um, Miss James's class, you guys have another great question in the chat, and I'm going to head back to Mr. Lou in a minute. Uh, Jace wants to know, how many manatees have you saved, either as an organization, personally, how many have you conserved in your time doing this work? Huh. Um, I mean, who's counting um, I would say I may have rescued, uh, in my years, in my capacity as, as, as the program, in the program, I think I may have rescued close to 25 or 30 animals. Um, some in need of, some in need of rehabilitation, some in need of just urgent care at the time and release back into the wild. But I may have rescued maybe 25 to 30. Suddenly I've taken away more dead men and this that I've taken away live. But I think I may have rescued somewhere around 25 to 30 in the years. Huh. I, but I started at a young age. I started at 11 years old. So yeah. I, I've, been, I've been around some time now. You are doing, honestly, that is an incredible story. If anyone can say that, that is a pretty great life to have lived. And you've got plenty more to go. I'm, I'm so excited for our kids to follow along with your story. Uh, Ms. Luge class, I'm going to head back to our great fours in Milton. YouTubers, feel free to chime in in the chat as well. But take us away, great fours. Hey. Uh, does the water pollution affect the manatees? Ooh, water pollution, yes. is it a threat? That's a good question. Water pollution does, a, does affect manatees. Just imagine that manatees live in the water. They feed in the water. Everything they do is in the water. So if you're living in a place that is unhealthy, you do the math, it means that you're going to be unhealthy as well. So manatees' health tend to be a reflection of their ecosystems. Hence the reason that we're doing research to look at their health. If we see animals that are looking unhealthy, it likely means that the habitat that they're living in is unhealthy. And that can affect their lifespan. That can affect their productivity. It can affect their, like I said, longevity. So it does affect them. If they're if the seagrass that they're eating is polluted, it means they're polluting themselves from the seagrass. We are what we eat. We often say that. Some of them eat their environment. So they are what they eat as well. And they're great indicator species. Yeah, that's a, a great way of describing it. And I really like that as an approach, highlighting the fact that, again, they, they live in a place where pollution directly impacts the thing that they directly eat. If you get your food from a farm that has pesticides or something thrown all over it and you eat that, you're going to be impacted by what happens there. The same principle applies with our manatees. And I'm really glad we got that question. Thanks, guys. Miss mm -hmm. McNeil's class, I'm coming back to you. Time flies and you're having fun, Jamal. And we're nearly done the broadcast. So I'm going to head back to Alberta for one final question before we wrap up with a, a coup de gras at the end. Uh, two threes, you're good to go. Hey, I'm your mic. Here you are. Hello. Sorry, we weren't expecting another question. What's your question, Gabe? Um, if they have good hearing, where are the ears? Ooh, I like that. Ah, that's a good question. So I, I've never been asked that question before. That's a new one. So one of these do have ears. They don't have external ears like us, so you can see it's internal. It looks like a small hole. It has you have to be very, 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 very good to look at it. It's just a finger length from the eyes. We measure we measure one of these ear from from the mouth to the eye, eye to the ear. So the ear is just above their eyes. And it's a small opening, but it's not an external ear. It's an internal ear. Every time we get a question that someone's never been asked before, especially someone like you who's done this for years, I just love it. So thank you so much, man. That was a great question. Uh, classes. I know we could talk about manatees all day. Uh, unfortunately, we're nearing the end of the broadcast. I know some of you are off to lunch soon. And so I will encourage you, check out Instagram, check out The Real Manatee Man. You can see much more of Jamal's work. Again, one of the most charismatic and passionate conservationists I've ever had the chance to, to feature on this broadcast. So I hope you're as excited as I am. Jamal, before we wrap up and I bring in our classes to say a big thanks and farewell, is there any final message you want to share with our kids? Whether they're joining in uh, Belize itself, Florida, if they're in the middle of a continent, how can they help manatees? What can we do to, to lead them with today? You can help manatees and other species wherever you are. Um, there's no excuse. No, like I said, there's no age restrictions. You just have to have the, the desire and the willingness to do so. Remember, I started at 11 years old. 
you can start now. The, long, the sooner you start, the more you'll get done. The sooner you start, the more species you can help. The sooner you start, the more experience you'll gather. The sooner you start, by the time you get to my age, you'd have done a lot more than I have done. So I encourage you to find that one thing that inspires you, whether it's bird, dogs, whales, manatees, dolphins, hippos, elephants. Find that one thing that drives you to want to make a difference and do as best as you can with what you can, whether it's sharing a post on social media, whether it's sending a note of thank you to people around the world that are doing the work to encourage them to continue doing the work. I get letters all the time and I never, I never get rid of them because it's my encouragement. It's days that I have that sometimes I get discouraged and I read those letters and it gets me going. And I, I know that someone in Alberta, someone in, in Europe, someone in Africa, someone in Arizona cares about the work that we're doing in Belize and that drives me. So don't yeah. underestimate the impact that you can make on this world. I'm going to leave right now and just get on a plane and come help you with vanities, I think, because yeah. I'm inspired. I know our classes are too. Jamal, thank you so much, man. You have deserved every accolade you've gotten this year. I'm so happy you're a new dad. That's so exciting. And uh, as you know, from what we do to end every broadcast, I'm going to bring in our classes to say a big thank you and farewell. Miss McNeil, Miss Lou, Miss James at home, YouTubers, if you guys want to scream out and yell, thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful day. <laughs>